It's a nightmare to be alive. Basically every animal that has ever come into being has labored under the dark gloomy skies of pain and suffering. That's not to say that life is only pain and suffering. There are certainly brief moments of contentment, joy, and even happiness, but it would be an error to mistake the exception for the rule. It's a nightmare to be alive. All animals, including humans, are constantly met with difficulties such as hunger, disease, and homelessness. There are animals who thrive on the death and decay of other animals. There are parasites whose whole purpose is to eat the eyes of little children. Children are diagnosed with bone and brain cancer all the time, and elderly people are met with Alzheimer's disease and a slew of other illnesses on their way to oblivion. Some might dismiss this mindset as cynical, pessimistic, or even nihilistic, but the fact remains, to live is to suffer. Some might suggest that there's plenty to be thankful and grateful for in the world. And this is true, for some people, but the bottom line is that all people experience pain and suffering on a daily basis. According to a 2023 report, there are 2.3 billion people on this planet who don't have sufficient access to food. That's about 30% of the human population. It might be difficult to wrap our heads around how almost one-third of human beings don't have good access to food, while those of us in first world countries tend to complain that McDonald's didn't leave off the pickles on our Big Mac or that Target sold out of the newest Stanley Tumblr before we had a chance to get one. This absurdity is what I call the crisis of spoils, which could be defined as the propensity for those in wealthy countries to exaggerate or mistake their fleeting inconveniences as persistent threats to their well-being. We don't have to resort to McDonald's and Stanley Tumblrs to grasp the magnitude of suffering that exists on this planet. Consider the now extinct Cervus Giganticus, otherwise known as the Irish Elk. Its antlers were 12 feet across and weighed up to 90 pounds. The animal died out around 10,000 years ago, and scientists are still not in agreement about the reason why it went extinct. But we can easily imagine that its antlers weighed it down, pinning its head to the ground. In nature, judging that the evolutionary ornament was not its best creation, allowed it to eventually fizzle into non-existence. There are around 132 suicide deaths in the United States per day. Heart diseases and strokes and diabetes claim lives every single day. And there doesn't seem to be an end to the madness. Author and philosopher Thomas Ligotti said, Human life moves only in one direction, toward disease, damage, and death. The best you can hope for is to remain stagnant or, in certain cases, return to a previous condition when things weren't as bad as they've become for you. Ligotti's flourish could be why we tend to romanticize the past, even though we know it wasn't all that great in the first place. Nostalgia has a way of consuming us, especially in those times we feel most vulnerable. Nostalgia, as with anything not grounded in the present, could be thought of as our mind's way of staying away from what's most painful. I submit here that anything that takes us away from the present moment is a form of pain evasion, both physically and psychologically. The question of suffering has been the subject of intense debate since the beginning of recorded history. The Epic of Gilgamesh, the Bible, the Buddha, and many other ancient texts all had things to say about the human plight here on Earth. And one important element that all these worldviews have in common is that human experience, barring the hope of spiritual transcendence, is powered by the fuel of pain, suffering, discontentment, and nightmares. Almost all of us, at one point or another, have felt the torturous twist of existence. It's not necessary to draw out every disease, parasite, an evolutionary failure for us to realize that the world makes a very good case for itself that suffering is the point of life. The 19th century German philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer said, if the immediate and direct purpose of our life is not suffering, then our existence is the most ill-adapted to its purpose in the world. Given the evidence, this is a pretty good argument. We take medication to put down aches and pains. We watch sports and go to the movies to keep ourselves from getting bored which could be understood as another form of psychological pain and discomfort. And then we have religious traditions, many of which promise an afterlife where everything will be pure, unalloyed bliss. In the biblical book of James, chapter 1, verses 2-4, through 4, it says, 
Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Schopenhauer would affectionately respond, that a God like Jehovah should create this world of want and misery capriciously and voluntarily, and then go so far as to applaud himself for it, saying it is all very good, that is quite unacceptable. And I agree. It's understood that most people don't find joy in their pain and suffering. That's what makes this Bible verse, among many others, so provocative. Should people who are starving to death really find joy in that? Should those suffering a malignant illness be grateful on their way to oblivion? Should a mother who is watching her child wither away from bone cancer thank God above for the opportunity to experience such a thing? For many, these questions would be met with a resounding, fuck no. However, many people throughout history have counted their sufferings as badges of honor. The thinking goes, if I suffer enough on earth, I'll receive an unimaginable reward in heaven after I die. The phenomenon of self-flagellation, previously so common in Catholicism, finds its fulfillment in the so-called mortification of the flesh. Self-flagellation, at least from a religious point of view, was thought to spiritually discipline the adherent in preparation for the afterlife. If you've never watched The Da Vinci Code or First Reformed, self-flagellation is a prominent theme. For a growing number of people, the promise of an afterlife that will somehow right all the wrongs carried out on earth no longer cuts the mustard. Schopenhauer said that the most perfect manifestation of the will to live represented by the human organism, with its incomparably ingenious and complicated machinery, must crumble to dust and its whole essence and all its striving be palpably given over at last to annihilation. This is nature's unambiguous declaration that all the striving of this will is essentially vain. If it were something possessing value in itself, something which ought unconditionally to exist, it would not have non-being as its goal. If life contains some morsel of divinity within it, why does life always end in obliteration? Why isn't there a kind of reconciliation at the end of our time here? No one knows the answer to these questions, and it's very likely we never will. We are perpetually locked in the hamster wheel of life, knowing full well that our doom is right around the corner. We may wonder why the human mind can conceive of some ultimate meaning when the universe doesn't seem to contain one. This existential jam is the pinnacle of absurdity. Schopenhauer believed that pain and suffering were among the most palpable elements in the world. The things we really want in life, namely contentment, joy, and happiness, are nothing more than the absence of pain and suffering. These desirable states of being are nothing in themselves. Just as darkness is the absence of light, Happiness and joy is merely the absence of pain and suffering. Therefore, Schopenhauer advocated for something known as negative utilitarianism. Negative utilitarianism is the ethical position that our goal should be to decrease the prevalence of suffering in the world. This is a much different position than classical utilitarianism, which suggests that our primary aim should be to maximize our happiness and well-being. Despite our nightmarish condition, the world seems to prepare us for death every single day. Schopenhauer suggested that every night we lay our head down to sleep is a microcosm of death. We are alive, conscious, and completely in control during the day, and then the next moment, at night, we're asleep, following the fancies of our sleeping mind. The German philosopher compared this phenomenon with death. The fact that a simulation of death is biologically nested within life itself is among the darkest forms of irony. It seems that life could be conceived as a kind of purgatory a place where all living creatures are sent to pay for an evil they never committed. When we look at innocent animals and babies, one can very quickly be overcome with sadness and resentment over the nature of reality. The progress of science and eventual dissolution of archaic philosophies could very well lead future generations to a less painful and suffering existence, but there's no way to completely sever the creature from its condition, which is suffering. There's a lot that science can do, and there's a lot that science can't do. And one thing science cannot do is measure the sorrow of a heart with a scalpel. The world will always contain pain and suffering. But like Schopenhauer suggests, the most immediate palliative is tolerance, patience, forbearance, and charity. And because we all need these things, we have an obligation to give them too. 
As Peter Zapfa writes in his essay entitled The Last Messiah, there is a brotherhood of suffering between everything alive. And in that way, there's a twinkle of beauty in the midst of the rubble.